Welcome to the Debug Digital Designs Faster with Advanced Parametric Triggering Web Seminar. We will begin shortly and ask you to stand the line and take this time to log on to the web presentation. The details can be found in your email invitation. The Agilent Infinite Vision Oscilloscopes Product Manager and is responsible for bringing new and innovative system verification and validation solutions to students and engineers in the electronics industry. For everyone's comfort, this is a lecture-style meeting. However, you can send questions in writing at any time during the session through the Q&A functionality of the WebEx meeting. You'll be, we'll, we'll do our best to answer your questions during the session that may come back to you after the session if we haven't been able to. While the answer to your question may be published for others to see, we'll keep your identity private. Please note that this webcast will be recorded so you can review and share with your colleagues at any time. And with that, I'll hand over to Mary Jane. Uh, thank you, Eric, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, attending today. Today we're going to be talking about um, some advanced parametric triggering available um, on our 3000X series oscilloscope. So although fast waveform update rates can reveal, often reveal signal integrity problems, capturing intermit intermittent parametric circuit problems while using a scope stand standard edge triggering mode is really still based on statistical odds. Not only can advanced parametric triggering help synchronize oscilloscope acquisitions and display known complex signal activity, but this type of triggering can also be used to test for signal parametric violation conditions, such as setup and hold time, edge speed, and pulse amplitude violations, as well as pulse width violations. Agilent's new DSO and MSO 3000 X-Series InfiniVision oscilloscopes come standard with a variety of advanced parametric triggering and search and navigation capabilities. During this presentation, you will learn the meaning of each of these violation signal conditions, as well as how to set up the scope to trigger on and test for a variety of these violation conditions using our built-in training signals and advanced triggering and search and navigation capability. Many of today's digital storage oscilloscopes have advanced capabilities that can help uncover signal anomalies. Fast waveform update rates, intensity graded displays, Mass testing, as well as search and navigation, are all tools that can help re reveal signal violations. But all these particular tools are statistical based. For instance, fast waveform update rates can often catch infrequent glitz glitches. With a waveform update rate of up to 1 million waveforms per second, Agilent's 3000 X-Series scope can catch events that other scopes miss. But what if an anomalous event occurs just every billion trigger events? Then we need to look for the advanced parametric triggering, which is a non-statistical oscilloscope tool that can be used to lock onto parametric signal violations. If you can specify a trigger condition that uniquely describes the signal characteristics to trigger on, then the scope's hardware effectively goes into babysit mode and sits and waits for the event to occur. And if that event occurs, then the scope will catch it. This presentation will show examples of all of these tools to help uncover various types of parametric signal violations. As mentioned earlier, the most common type of triggering that engineers use on their scopes today is edge triggering. Edge triggering is a very non-discriminating type of triggering that is often used to trigger on any occurrence of a known repetitive input signal. But oscilloscope triggering can be used in order to synchronize the scope's acquisitions on suspected fault or signal violation conditions as well. The screenshot on the left shows an example of triggering on any rising edge of the input signal, which is a repetitive digital pulse in this case. If a signal anomaly occurs, and if you're lucky, you might catch it. The screenshot on the right, however, shows an example of triggering on a narrow and infrequent glitch using a time-qualified pulse width triggering. If and when this narrow glitch occurs, the scope will go ahead and catch it. Although edge triggering is most, the most commonly used type of oscilloscope triggering, many of today's have advanced triggering in order to synchronize these acquisitions. With advanced parametric triggering, we've got pulse width triggering, nth edge burst triggering, setup and hold, runt, and edge speed. And we will cover all of these in the presentation today. This oscilloscope also comes with serial bus triggering. And with a variety of serial um, protocols available, these 
offer specific triggering capabilities specific to that protocol. This slide shows an example of the help screen of the Agilent 3000 X-Series oscilloscope for pulse width triggering. At Agilent, we have tried to add as much information as we can into the help screen because we know that sometimes triggering is a complicated issue on scopes. So here you can see on this screen that the help screen gives you exactly all the detailed information of what the scope is going to be triggering on so that you know that you have the right triggering for your application. With pulse width triggering, the scope monitors the input signal for either a positive or negative pulses that meet the criteria you specify. You can specify to trigger on pulses that are narrower than a specific time value, or you can specify to trigger on pulses that are wider than a specific value. Or you can trigger on the pulses that have a width within a user-specified time range. Let's now see some examples of our pulse width triggering. Using the digital burst within frequent glitch built-in training signal, and I just wanted to mention here, we have built-in training signals for the oscilloscope to allow us to be able to demo um, all the capabilities of the oscilloscope without actually having to have an external demo board. So what we see here is the screenshot on the left shows an example of triggering a unique pulse within a digital burst. The fifth pulse within the burst has a pulse width of approximately 300 nanoseconds. To trigger on this pulse, we use the scope's pulse width trigger mode and specify to trigger on a positive pulse that has a width that is greater than 250 nanoseconds but less than 350 nanoseconds, as you can see here by the time qualification of this trigger. While triggering on the, this pulse, the scope's fast waveform update rate, we can see a narrow and infrequent glitch occurring near the end of the burst. To now trigger on this narrow and infrequent pulse glitch, we have specified to trigger on a positive pulse that has a width of less than 50 nanoseconds, as shown here on the screenshot on the right. Note that if this glitch is extremely infrequent, we would need to use the scope's normal triggering mode in order to prevent auto-triggering. This slide shows an example of the help screen of our triggering for the nth edge burst. With nth edge burst triggering, the scope arms for triggering during the idle time between the bursts of the digital signal and then triggers on the nth occurrence of an edge transition during the next digital burst. Let's now see an example of nth edge burst triggering using one of the scope's built-in training signals. For this measurement example, we are using a digital burst signal. This training signal produces digital bursts that are approximately 40 milliseconds wide with a signal idle time between each burst of approximately 10 microseconds. To trigger on the third rising edge of each burst, we have specified a minimum idle time of 5 microseconds, as you can see here down in the trigger menu, and then specified to trigger on the third rising edge of the burst here in the next setup of this trigger. Note that in order to properly arm triggering during the idle time between each burst, the specified idle time must be greater than the widest positive or negative pulse width within each burst, but less than the minimum actual idle time between each burst. In this case, since the widest pulse in each burst is approximately 2 microseconds, and the actual idle time between each burst is approximately 10 microseconds, 5 microseconds is a good setting for the minimum idle time. Now we're going to talk about setup and hold violation triggering. Again, this screenshot shows an example of the help screen of the Agilent 3000 series for setup and hold time, so that you can see exactly what the scope will be triggering on. When data is transferred from one device to another, it is often clocked into the device. However, the data signal must be stable, either a high or a low, a minimum amount of time before the occurrence of the clock edge. This is called the minimum setup time. In addition, the data signal must remain stable, either high or low, for a minimum amount of time after the occurrence of the clock edge. And this is called the required hold time. Let's now see an example of viewing and detecting a setup time violation while using edge triggering on the clock. And then we're going to use the scope setup and hold time violation trigger to synchronize the acquisitions on all the setup time violations. 
This screenshot shows an example of the scope setup and hold time violation built in training signal. The channel 1, or the yellow waveform, is the clock signal. And the channel 2, or the green waveform, is the data signal. While triggering on the rising edges of the clock signal, with the scope's fast waveform update rate, we can see all polarities and transitions of the data signal. This display of the data signal is typically called an eye diagram display because it represents a circular or an eye pattern. The rising and falling transitions of the data signal typically occur about 30 nanoseconds before the rising edge of the clock signal. These transitions of the data signal are represented by the brighter green traces. However, we can also see here some dimmer green transitions that occur much closer to the clock edge. If we assume that the device that these signals are to be clocked into has a minimum setup time specification of 25 nanoseconds, then some of the data transitions are in violation of this specification. Note that if the frequency of occurrence violations were much more infrequent, then viewing these violations may be difficult without specifically setting up the scope to trigger exclusively on the violations. And now we're going to set up the scope to trigger exclusively on the setup time violations of the signal shown here. Using the scope setup and hold time violation triggering, we have set up the scope to exclusively trigger on setup time violations if the data setup time violates a minimum user specified time of 25 nanoseconds, as shown here in the trigger setup menu. Using the scope's timing cursors, as shown here in the orange dotted lines, we actually see that these data signals violate the minimum setup time of 25 nanoseconds, and they're actually in the range of approximately 16 nanoseconds. So now we're going to use what's called a segmented memory acquisition mode to capture 1,000 consecutive occurrences of these setup time violations. With the scope still set up to trigger on setup time violations, a thousand consecutive occurrences of these violations can be captured and reviewed using segmented memory mode of acquisition. Segmented memory mode optimizes the scope's available acquisition memory by only capturing selective segments of the input signal. In this case, the scope is only capturing the setup time violations. In this example, the last captured setup is the 1,000th setup time violation, and it occurred approximately 38.36 milliseconds after the first violation. Capturing this much waveform data using conventional acquisition memory at a high sample rate would be impossible with any of the scopes in their memory on the market today in this space. Now we're going to talk about our runt triggering capability. Again, with the help screen, you can see that the scope now is going to trigger. You can trigger on a negative runt pulse here, or a positive runt pulse, or a negative runt pulse. A runt pulse is a digital pulse that fails to meet a user-specified high or low threshold. Triggering on these runt pulses requires that you define this upper and lower limit that your signal must cross. This screen shows an example of the scope's runt pulse built-in training signal. While triggering on rising edges of the signal, we can see that the high and low amplitude of some of these signals fail to achieve their intended logic levels. These are the uh, regular amplitude signals here, and here we see the runt pulses. Now we can use our mass testing capability to reveal the runt pulses. We can create a waveform pass or fail mask on a known good pulse. And then we can test repetitively additional signals to see which signals may be runs or in violation. With the fast hardware-based mass testing capability of the scope, up to 240,000 mass tests per second, we can see that approximately 0.7 of the captured pulses are runt pulses. And that is shown here in our statistical rate. Uh, with the mass testing, we also have statistics available so that you can see the number of tests ran, the number of failures, and hear what the actual failure rate is. Another tool we can use to detect rump pulses is the scope's search and navigation capability. 
While still using the edge triggering, and with the time base set to 100 microseconds to, per division, we can capture one millisecond of continuous waveform data. Now search and navigation on both positive and negative rent pulses finds and marks the 20 occurrences of these rent pulses. We can then use the scope's forward and rewind buttons to quickly navigate to each runch pulse. As shown here, I'm pushing the arrow button as it would be shown right here with the circle, and you can then search through each of the rump pulses, and you can see them all the way through. The white marks here at the top mark each of the events that we found, in this case, rump pulses. And this search event tab up here lets you know which out of which event, in this case, eight, we're on the eighth rump pulse, out of the 20 that the scope has captured. Now we're going to set up the scope to trigger exclusively on runt pulses. If the occurrence of the runt pulses occur often enough, then the scope's fast update rate of up to 1 million waveforms per second can show these signals while triggering on edges. But if the occurrence of the runt pulse is extremely infrequent, perhaps one in a billion, then reliably viewing these runts requires triggering on them. Here we show an example of triggering on positive runt pulses of any width. In addition to triggering on positive runs, we can also select to trigger on negative runs, runs of any polarity, and also specify triggering on runs of specific widths. Now we can also use the scope's segmented memory mode to capture 1,000 consecutive runs. While triggering on rump pulses of any width and any polarity, we have used the scope's segmented memory acquisition mode to capture 1,000 consecutive events of runt pulses. Note that the last captured runt segment occurs nearly 50 milliseconds after the first capture or runt segment. This allows us to get a much better view of what's going on in the system when we can capture only those pulses that are falling short of their intended logic levels. And we can see a 1,000 occurrences of them so that we can get some kind of information as to what's going on in the system causing these runt pulses. Now we're going to talk about some rise and fall time violation triggering. Again, this is the example of the help screen that shows exactly what this trigger does to the signal. When using a rise or fall time violation, the scope triggers on signals that have edge speeds that are in violation of a user specified time. For example, if this if the signals in your system are specified to have rise times faster than 20 nanoseconds, then you could use rise time violation triggering to synchronize the scope's acquisition system on signals that have rise times slower than 20 nanoseconds. While using the standard rising edge triggering of any speed on the scope's edge transition violation built-in training signal, we can see that the rising edges with two different transition times as well as falling edges with two different transition times. Note that the scope's fast update rate enhances our ability to see the less frequently occurring slower transitions and displays these slower transitions in a lighter intensity or a lighter yellow color as shown here. This is part of what the intensity graded display offers on the Agilent oscilloscope so that you can see how much more frequently uh, certain signals occur. If a signal occurs more often, then it will be shown in a darker color. If it is very infrequent, then it will be shown in a lighter color, just for the intensity grading, or a dimmer trace. We can also verify the different edge speeds of the signal using the scope's automatic rise and fall time measurements with statistics. These measurements show that the signal has a minimum rise time and fall time of approximately 50 nanoseconds, but occasionally slows down to a maximum transition time of 125 nanoseconds. And these are the statistics that are available right here. And with the fast update rate of the Agilent 3000X series, these statistics are, are updating at incredibly fast speeds. We can now create a mass test again based on one of the faster rising edges. And then use our mass test statistics to tell us that approximately 5% of the rising edges of our system have significantly lower rise times. 
as you can see here by the failure rate statistic. Now we could also perform a similar mass test on the falling edges, but we just did the rising edges here for an example. Again, we can use our search and navigation uh, capability to detect edge transition violation signals. We can still use the edge triggering, and with a time base set, time base set to 100 microseconds per division, we will capture one millisecond of continuous waveform data. Then we can use our search and navigation on rising edges and set it with rise times greater than 100 nanoseconds to find and mark the occurrences of the slow rising edges. As you can see here, the scope has found five such events. That means it's found five signals with slow rising edges. We can then navigate through the scope's forward and backward keys to show each of the rising edges. And you can see here that this is a zoomed in or a, a zoomed out version of the signal. And this white line here shows this portion here that we're actually zooming in on. So as you go through the different events, you can see where in the trace the event is happening. And then you can see an actual zoomed in version of it on the lower portion of the screen. This slide has a similar search, but only on following edges. And as you can see here, again, we had the events of five of those that we found that we could search through here. Now we can set up the scope to exclusively trigger on falling edges that are slower than 100 nanoseconds. In this measurement example, we have set up the scope to trigger on rising edges slower than 100 nanoseconds. And you can see that here by the setup time. And again, that is adjustable based on what your specifications would be. Now, this is a fall time uh, measurement. And we've set up the scope here to trigger on falling edges that are slower than 100 nanoseconds. We can now use the scope segmented memory acquisition to capture 1,000 consecutive occurrences of the edges with the rise times that are slower than 100 nanoseconds, and also 1,000 consecutive occurrences of the edges with fall times slower than 100 nanoseconds. While triggering on rising in edges slower than 100 nanoseconds, you can see that the segmented memory acquisition was able to capture up to 1,000 segments of these occurrences of rise time edges that are slower than 100 nanoseconds. Note here again that the last captured segment is almost 200 nanoseconds, sorry, milliseconds after the first violation edge. Again, capturing this much data with traditional scope acquisition memory would be impossible. But with segmented memory, we're able to maximize the scope's acquisition memory, and we're able to capture up to 1,000 segments. This is a similar example of capturing 1,000 consecutive occurrences of the falling edges that are slower than 100 nanoseconds. And again, notice that this last segment is almost 200 milliseconds after the first segment. These scopes also come with the ability to have serial bus triggering and decoding. This can be critical to help debug certain designs that have serial bus capability in it. This allows the oscilloscope to synchronize on complex waveform data, including serial commu communication error conditions. Agilent's InfiniVision series scopes support a wide range of broad serial bus protocols. These include I squared C and SPY, RS-232 and UART. It also includes RS-485 and some other variations of those protocols. It includes some automotive triggering capability in decode, CAN and LIN, as well as FlexRay, as well as an audio protocol, which is the I2S protocol. And we have an aerospace and defense protocol, MIL standard 1553 and AIRINC 429. 
As you can see in the screenshot here, that's actually moving very quickly. This is an animated GIF, and it's uh, designed to show you how quickly the waveform update rate can affect um, the oscilloscopes. As you can see here, occasionally there is a red error flashing right here. Now, although this scope is updating so fast, it's really hard to catch uh, with the human eye. Again, this is the 1 million waveforms per second of update rate. But you can see here that it lets you know how many frames are going by and what the error rate is. This is extremely valuable when debugging entire systems and doing whole system correlation. This allows you to really see what's happening on the serial buses. And our high update rate allows you to catch these errors that other scopes may miss because they're not able to update very f as fast. Again, we see here on this screen as well that this is a, um, a wider view or a zoomed out view of the signals going across. And you can see the packets um, flittering by here. These are all different packets coming through. This is a, actually happens to be CAN packets. And then if you choose this packet right here, you can see that this whole signal right here is actually the zoomed in portion um, of, from a, a part on the top of the screen. This allows you to get a much better view of what's going on with basically the zoomed out vision of all the packets and a zoomed in version as well on the lower part of the screen. So in summary, we want you to remember from this presentation that fast waveform update rates really help reveal uh, signal anomalies. We showed that the intensity graded displays uh, help reveal uh, signal anomalies as well by the different uh, brightness and intensities of the signals on the screen. So you can see what occurs more often and what occurs less frequently. We have mass testing, and that actually is able to help reveal signal anomalies as well. The search and navigation capability is able to capture specific events, and then you can search right through those events in order to see each one of those in detail. And we also have a variety of advanced parametric triggering that allows the scope to lock in on these signal anomalies. This includes the pulse width, the nth edge burst, the setup and hold time violation, the various runt triggering, and the rise and fall time variations. We've also shown you how to use a segmented memory acquisition mode to capture up to 1,000 consecutive events of these signal anomalies. This will all allow you to reduce your debug time on your, on your instruments or your devices under test that you're triggering on and debugging, because it gives you so many more tools and helps speed your debug time so that you can spend your time solving any issues that you need to and getting these products out to market, rather than spending your time trying to figure out how to set up your oscilloscope uh, to debug these. This is a summary of our entire InfiniVision series of oscilloscopes. These scopes are engineered for the best signal visibility. And you saw that by the intensity graded screen, as well as our really fast waveform update rate. We cover bandwidths all the way from 70 megahertz all the way up to 1 gigahertz. And in a variety of form factors, you can see our two newest scopes here, the 2000 series and the 3000 series, are a nice short uh, compact form factor. And then you have our large screen, which is our 12.1 inch screen XGA display. This is our 7000B series. And that has up to 8 megapoints of memory. And you can also see here, sitting under here, is a little flat scope. Uh, we call this our pizza box or our pancake scope. And that is our scope that is really useful for rack mounting. You can fit, it's only one U high. So it can fit quite a few of those in a rack. It does not have a display, as most of these test systems are automated from a PC um, as well. So that's really nice to fit quite a few of those in a rack. All right, that's all I had today. But with this time, we'd like to open up the presentation for um, some additional questions that you may have about uh, Agilent oscilloscopes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary Jane. Um, as uh, Mary Jane mentioned, it's just, uh, time for questions and answers. So you can uh, send questions in writing uh, now through the Q&A functionality of the WebEx meeting. 
And we'll do our best to answer your questions during the session, but uh, may come back to you after the session if we haven't been able to. Uh, while your answer, uh, while the answer to your question may be uh, published for others to see, we'll keep your identity private. Um, so let's have a look what questions we have already. Um, okay, let's start with this one. Um, does all this triggering capability come standard when you purchase the scope, Mary Jane? Uh, yes, it does. All of the triggering that we've um, went over today does come standard. Uh, there are a few of the um, mass testing and segmented memory acquisition that are not standard. Those are additional options. Um, but all of the specific triggering that we talked about does come standard on the scope when you purchase it. Okay, great. Um, the next one uh, is the search and navigation feature something new? Um, it is something new. We actually introduced it um, a couple years ago on our 7000B oscilloscope. Um, and using basically research from customers like you on the phone, uh, we talked to them about what, their, um, what they were doing on a scope and what would help them um, speed up their debug. And one of the tools that they talked about was the ability to capture large amounts of data and then search for specific um, events or specific triggers on that. And so we did implement that, and it has basically the forward and backward play buttons just like it would on a, on a Blu-ray player, so it's uh, very easy to use. And that does come standard on the 3000 X series as well as the 7000 B series. Okay, thank you. Um, next. Can you explain segmented memory? Does it come standard with the scope? Okay, so segmented memory is um, something that um, our really innovative Agilent engineers have come up with. And what it does is it takes the entire memory record. So, for example, on the 3000X series, we have four megapoints of memory. It takes that, meg um, that memory record and it divides it up into up to 1,000 segments. So you can select how many number of segments, anywhere from zero or anywhere from one to 1,000. And then what it does is instead of capturing how normal and more normal oscilloscopes work is they just capture all the data. But during um, bursty signals such as serial or signals with some idle time, so you'll have some signal activity and then some idle time, um, all of that idle time is, is being captured and it's filling up all of your oscilloscope memory. But what segmented memory does is it does not capture any of that idle time. It only captures the periods of signal activity. So there where you can see that you don't lose all your oscilloscope's memory capturing that um, idle time. So now you can capture huge records of data um, with, with an oscilloscope that has, let's say, four mega points of memory. And it is not standard. It is actually a four-pay option that you can add onto the scope at the time of purchase, or you can upgrade later um, by just getting a software license key. It can be used with serial decoding, and it can be used with um, any of the triggering that we showed here today. So it can be used in conjunction with other scope options as well as some of the things that come standard on the scope. Okay, thank you, Mary Jane. Um, there's one last question. Uh, you mentioned mask testing uh, to reveal edge violations. How do you create the mask on the scope? Yes, yeah, so the mass testing option on the scope, um, again, it's a four-pay option, but what you can do is you go into the scope's menu, and you have a known good signal coming into, let's say, channel one. So you have uh, your scope probe on your signal on your device under test, and you see a good signal coming through. Within the mass testing uh, menu, you just simply select auto mask and create mask, and the scope uh, software is intelligent enough to create all of the X and Y tolerances of the mask, and it creates a mask around that known good signal. You could also manually enter what the X and Y tolerances are and kind of create your own mask that way. Um, but just using it on a known good signal is a really quick way to do it. But again, you could define masks using any of the X, Y tolerances that you need to put on there. And again, that is a for pay option. Great, thank you. Um, if you have any questions after the event or want to ask these offline, uh, don't hesitate uh, to contact us uh, on the address provided. In a few seconds' time, when I close uh, the, 